Greetings and welcome to the At Home Fourth Quarter Fiscal Year 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn this conference over to your host, Mr. Arvind Bhatia, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for At Home's fourth quarter fiscal year 21 earnings results conference call. On the call today are Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Lee Bird, President and Chief Operating Officer Peter Corsa, Chief Merchandising Officer Chad Stoffer, and Chief Financial Officer Jeff Knudsen. After the team has made their formal remarks, we will open the call to questions. Before we begin, I need to remind you that certain comments made during this call may constitute forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. Such forward-looking statements are subject to both known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause our actual results or performance to differ materially from such statements. Known risks and uncertainties are referred to in at-home's press release issued today and in our SEC filings, including our annual report on Form 10-K and subsequent reports. The forward-looking statements made today are as of the date of this call or other specified dates, and at-home does not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements except as required by law. Any discussion during this call of our results for the current quarter to date are subject to variability and may not be indicative of our results or trends for any full reporting period. Finally, the speakers may refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures on this call. A reconciliation schedule showing the comparable GAAP versus non-GAAP financial measures is available in at-home's press release issued today. If you do not have a copy of today's press release, you may obtain one by visiting the Investor Relations page of the website at investor.athome.com. I will now turn the call over to Lee. Lee? Thanks, Darvin, and thank you all for joining us today. Before we share our Q4 results with you, I want to take a moment to thank our nearly 7,700 team members for their continued dedication and hard work despite unprecedented challenges this past year. Their resilience was critical in helping us deliver a record year while remaining focused on our highest priority of protecting the health and safety of our team members and customers. Turning to the results, I'm extremely pleased with our record Q4 performance and the continued momentum in our business. Comp store sales of nearly 31% were well ahead of our increased expectations of 23 to 24% due to acceleration of our business in January. Our new and non-comp stores also continue to perform well on all key metrics. As a result of upside in sales and strong flow through to the bottom line, we delivered pro forma adjusted EPS of $1.08 and adjusted EBITDA of nearly $120 million, well ahead of consensus expectations. Financially, we're in our strongest position ever as a public company, ending the quarter with more than $125 million in cash, nothing drawn on our ABL facility, and a record low leverage ratio of 0.5 times down from 3.2 times a year ago. Consistent with the last several quarters, our outstanding Q4 performance was broad-based in terms of departments, geography, and age of stores, and it was driven by strong growth in both traffic and ticket. Within our everyday business, all departments comp solidly positive as shoppers continue to decorate, organize their homes, and spend time in their kitchens. Q4 comp in wall decor, textiles, accent decor and furniture, home organization, and kitchen entertainment were well above company average. Seasonal comps exceeded expectations despite inventory constraints as we sold through nearly 90% of Christmas product at full price compared to our typical 70%, leading to the most profitable Christmas season in our history. Geographically, all districts were strong and overall performance across our newer and older stores was consistent including stores older than five years. As I mentioned during January, we experienced an acceleration in our business. 
We believe this was driven by a combination of factors, including the benefit of a second stimulus, our more expansive bed, bath, and storage EDLP Plus event, and success in replenishing inventory in the face of supply challenges. Strong early sell-through of our spring seasonal merchandise was also a small contributor to a January's outperformance and an encouraging indicator of our continued growth in fiscal 2022. We remain excited about the success we are driving in our redefined go-to-market approach. Our EDLP Plus campaigns continue to highlight at-home sharper pricing and value proposition, while category reinventions and collaborations showcase newness and freshness. Our growing omni-channel business is also offering more convenience for our customers. We offer BOPUS and curbside in all of our stores, and local delivery from more than 70% of our stores. The expanded delivery partnership with Pickup, including Postmates, is progressing well and was critical to serving our customers during a busy holiday season. Before I turn the call over to Chad, I want to quickly talk about trends in the ongoing first quarter. January's momentum has continued into fiscal 2022. We are off to a very strong start and see potential for Q1 comps of 142% to 153%. Obviously, we have easy comparisons due to mandated store closures in Q1 last year, but even on a two-year basis, our comp trends have accelerated from the fourth quarter. Jeff will provide additional color on sales and profitability expectations later in his prepared remarks. Last quarter, I mentioned how our chief merchant, Chad Stoffer, and his team are striking the right balance between the art and science of merchandising. I'm pleased to have Chad on the call this afternoon to share his thoughts on the factors driving our success and the significant opportunities in front of us. Following Chad's comments, our President and Chief Operating Officer, Peter Corsa, will provide an update on our operational initiatives before turning the call over to Jeff for a few financial highlights. Chad? Thanks, Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be on the call today to speak about the incredible strides we've made in all areas of merchandising. Over the past two years, we've significantly elevated our merchant organization through a series of focused investments. We've kept our customers at the center of our business and enhanced our capabilities to better meet their needs. We couldn't be prouder of our more disciplined and sustainable approach. As the leading value retailer of home decor, we know that our customer sees value as the intersection of three things, a broad assortment, unique product, and the best prices. First in this three-legged stool is our assortment. We are focused on making sure our customer is familiar with the unbeatable breadth that we offer. We out-assort other home decor stores with up to 50,000 items across 15 departments. For instance, we carry 55 different colors and patterns of patio cushions in 17 different shapes and sizes, and we carry more than 1,800 different bedding products and nearly 1,300 different wall decor skews in-store. Through our EDLP Plus campaigns, we are encouraging our customers to cross-shop additional departments. As we look back on the first year of these events, we're analyzing the results and refining our approach in fiscal 22. For some events, that means telling more inclusive stories and expanding the category for focus where appropriate. For instance, we pivoted last spring's bed and bath event to a bed, bath, and storage event this January that drove even stronger financial outcomes. Bringing the customer truly unique products is the second leg. We refocused our product trend and merchant teams on building cross-category themes and trends, we revived our discipline around reinvention execution, and developed new collaborator relationships. Our fourth quarter everyday category reinventions, such as kid bedding, healthy home, and candles, comes nearly twice the company average, continuing a positive trend and proving that our reinvention engine is working well. During Q1, we are focused on two key reinventions, wall art and home office, and quarter to date results are promising. We have completely revamped our wall art department by creating lifestyle sets, improving the fixtures, expanding the space for large art, and merchandising by color to improve customer shopability. We have also launched several brand new home office collections in a variety of styles. Our collaborations, which are multi-year rotating partnership with brands and designers, continue to be very important for us. These collaborations encompass a variety of seasons, styles, and rooms within our assortment. 
we highlighted traditional collections with rising home decor media star Grace Mitchell and iconic toy brand Ethio Schwartz in the fourth quarter. Launched an exclusive collection with London fashion designer Tracy Boyd in February, inspired by art, travel, adventure, and the patterns of Japan, and look forward to sharing the exciting details of a collaboration with a world-class athlete and TV host this fall. The third and final leg is having the best prices. We established an in-house team to ensure our price leadership across categories and key items, increasing both the discipline and frequency of our pricing analysis. During Q4, we offered lower opening price points in several key departments, which was instrumental in driving comps as well as lower markdowns. Our team is laser focused on both serving our customer and driving our business through sharp everyday low prices. As we turn the page to fiscal 22, we remain focused on striking the right balance between the art and science of merchandising. From an art standpoint, we're incredibly enthusiastic about our assortment this year. On the seasonal front, we've already seen strong performance from our new patio collection, which were coordinated with outdoor decor themes to enable customers to easily pull together a cohesive patio space. On the science side of the house, we are confident in our progress in pricing, sourcing, inventory management, and SKU rationalization will continue to enhance financial returns for the business. For context, when I joined at home nearly three years ago, our internal sourcing team was comprised of a handful of people. Since then, we have added bandwidth and deepened our capabilities, accelerating from practically no direct sourcing in fiscal 18 to 15% of our assortment at the end of fiscal 20 and nearly 20% today. In addition to hundreds of basis points of margin improvement on each item sourced directly, we are able to create a more agile supply chain, which allows us to diversify country risk, drive product quality, and improve speed to market as we work toward our longer term goal of direct sourcing 30% of the assortment. Our inventory management capabilities have followed a similar trajectory. We know that best in class retailers have unbelievable planning organizations and we have been building and strengthening those skills within at home. We have improved the synergy between the planning and buying functions. Our dedication to these capabilities enabled us to flex our planning muscle like never before this past year, including during periods of unprecedented sales, which has positioned us well as we enter fiscal 2022. Finally, we're exhibiting at home's company values of being smart and scrappy through our SKU rationalization and edit to amplify strategy. Our stores may be the largest one-stop shop for home decor, but it's important that each of our items has a clear purpose for our customer and drives optimal financial outcomes for our business. We are analyzing each category and eliminating less productive SKUs, reinvesting those inventory dollars into higher sell-through items and big ideas while still maintaining the impressive selection we are known for. Over time, this effort should improve inventory turns and generate better return on working capital. We began this effort in fiscal 21 with four out of our 15 departments and have already seen outsized comps in those areas. We plan to tackle another four to five departments this year, slightly reducing our total SKU count. I hope you can sense how excited and proud I am of the journey we've been on as a merchant organization and where we are today. From the very beginning, our vision has been to become a more vertically integrated home decor category killer. With our strengthening capabilities in trends and product development, pricing, sourcing, inventory planning and allocation, we are well on our way to realizing that vision. Retail is truly a team effort, so we are also incredibly grateful to the operations and field teams for helping to execute our vision in these stores every day. I'd like to turn the call over to Peter Corsa, President and COO, to talk through some of our operational developments. Peter. Thanks, Chad. Good afternoon, everyone. First off, I'd like to say thank you to our team members in the stores, distribution centers, and home office for delivering a truly incredible year for at home. We are so proud of our field leadership for navigating through unprecedented and challenging variables in fiscal 21. They implemented safety precautions that enabled us to reopen as soon as local regulations allowed, rolled out omni-channel options for our customers at lightning speed, and executed EDLP Plus events and reinventions that drove outsized results. 
their ability to adapt on a daily basis while staying focused on our key strategic priorities has been a driving force behind our record results. As you may remember, we typically flex our store labor to support both inventory flow and customer facing activity. We maintain that philosophy while improving our inventory position and delivering more than 30% comp sales growth in each of the last three quarters. As a result, our stores are well-staffed, clean, and organized while continuing to implement COVID safety protocols. Customer satisfaction and net promoter scores have continued to increase. In addition, Despite high levels of product flowing through our supply chain and onto the sales floor, our shrink rates have remained very low thanks to the process improvements we made in 2019. In fact, our labor productivity rates and freight processing times at both the stores and the distribution centers are the best we've ever seen. In recognition of such impressive teamwork and resilience helping us to drive record results, we're delighted to have paid out record bonuses for fiscal 21. Turning to fiscal 22, our biggest area of focus is the current international supply chain environment. As you know, for the past several months, consumer-driven industries have faced equipment shortages and shipping delays related to COVID disruption and a global increase in demand for goods. In turn, these constraints have significantly inflated freight costs for importers. We have been working closely with our transportation partners to help us navigate these challenges. We started by proactively adjusting our rate structure to move our shipments through the supply chain faster and support our extraordinary sales growth. As a result, our backlog rates are well below industry average. We have been prioritizing key items and seasonal product for our patio and garden assortment, as well as items related to our visual merchandising and marketing initiatives to help ensure the success of planned campaigns. We have also invested store labor to help speed incoming product to the sales floor, and our distribution centers are operating at peak efficiency, turning around freight in less than 24 hours. These efforts have enabled us to not only replenish inventory, but build our position despite continued shipping delays. In fact, we have been one of the top 40 importers in the U.S. for the past few months based on substantial cube volume we utilize. We have a high-class problem. With net sales growth above 40% in each of the last three quarters, there is record demand for our products. But because we are far exceeding our contracted volume, securing the product to satisfy the demand comes at a higher cost. While the current constraints in the global supply chain are beyond our control, I am extremely proud of how our team is managing and mitigating to the best of our ability. Our success is reflected in our ability to support the accelerating top line momentum we are seeing in the first quarter. We are in the process of negotiating our annual transportation contracts and the new rates will become effective May 1st. While it is difficult to predict the timing, we do expect freight costs will eventually normalize from the current elevated levels. With that, I'll turn the call over to our CFO, Jeff Knudsen, to provide a financial update. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to share a few financial highlights from our record Q4 results. As reported, net sales for the quarter were $562 million, or up 41.3%. Adjusted net income of $72.6 million, and pro forma adjusted EPS of $1.08 nearly tripled from the year-ago period. Adjusted EBITDA grew 94% to $119.6 million, and we generated free cash flow of more than $85 million during the quarter. As Lee mentioned, Comp sales were well ahead of our pre-announcement in early January, and flow-through to the bottom line was also very strong, which led to the significant earnings upside. As a reminder, the fourth quarter of fiscal 21 included an additional week versus fiscal 20. The extra week contributed $31.4 million in sales and generated an estimated $15.9 million in gross profits and $4.3 million in SG&A expense. As a result, 
we estimate the extra week contributed $11.6 million in adjusted EBITDA and $0.14 cents in EPS. While the earnings release we issued this afternoon mostly reports our key metrics for the 14 and 53 weeks ended January 30th, for ease of comparisons, I'm going to highlight a few key items on a 13 and 52 week basis. Q4 comps were 30.8% and total sales increased 33.4% to 530.6 million for the 13 week period. We estimate that Q4 gross profit was up 77.5% and gross margin increased 950 basis points to 38.2% on a 13 week basis, consistent with the improvement in Q3. Approximately 450 basis points of the improvement was driven by product margin expansion as we benefited from a higher mix of full price selling and reduced markdowns in both our everyday and seasonal departments. Occupancy and depreciation expense leverage on record fourth quarter sales growth and lower outbound freight costs drove the remaining gross margin improvement. Mandated store closures related to COVID-19 reduced our inventory flows in the first half of the year, reducing the outbound freight expense we recognized in the third and fourth quarters. As a reminder, Freight expense impacts cost of goods sold as inventory turns, and based on our turns, there is typically a two-quarter lag in the timing of when these costs hit our P&L. By the same token, increased inventory flow to support record demand, coupled with higher freight rates in the latter part of fiscal 21 and so far into Q1, will impact our P&L in fiscal 22. I'll shed more light on this momentarily. Q4 adjusted SG&A was an estimated $111.5 million, or 21% of sales, on a 13-week basis. This included slightly more than $5 million in performance-based incentive compensation above the normal run rate, reflecting our incredibly strong year. Relative to Q4 last year, our adjusted SG&A ratio increased 240 basis points, driven by higher incentive compensation and advertising expenses, partially offset by operating leverage on our strong sales performance. Within adjusted SG&A, store labor was approximately 7.2% of sales, in line with the full year, and advertising was approximately 3.5% of sales, compared to 2.5% for the full year. Turning to the full fiscal year, as reported, net sales of $1.74 billion were up 27.3% over fiscal 20, and adjusted net income was $173.6 million. Pro forma adjusted EPS was $2.68, as much as the prior three years combined. Looking at some of the key metrics on a 52-week basis, fiscal 21 comps were 19.4%, and net sales increased 25% to $1.7 billion. While we benefited from a wave of industry growth last year, we believe the strong execution of our at-home 2.0 strategy helped us gain meaningful market share, especially since fully reopening in June. On an estimated 52-week basis, gross profits were up 51%, and gross margins increased 590 basis points to 34.3%. Occupancy, depreciation, and distribution center expense leverage on record comps, along with lower outbound freight and distribution center costs, drove approximately 400 basis points of improvement. Product margin expansion as a result of a higher mix of full price selling accounted for the remaining increase in full year gross margin. On a 52-week basis, adjusted SG&A expense was up 14.1% year-over-year, and adjusted SG&A as a percent of sales was down 190 basis points to 20.1%. The improvement in adjusted SG&A as a percent of sales was a result of reduced pre-opening expenses as we temporarily paused new store openings at the onset of the pandemic, lower advertising costs, as we pulled back on advertising during the time our stores were closed and expense leverage on full year revenue growth of 25%. This improvement was partially offset by higher incentive compensation, 
reflecting our record performance. For the full year, Adjusted operating margins improved 780 basis points to 13.7%, and adjusted net income margins improved 700 basis points to 9.7% on an estimated 52-week basis. Adjusted EBITDA, excluding an estimated 11.6 million contribution from the extra week, was 347 million, or up 98%. This included approximately $24 million of net benefit from rent deferrals and rent abatements related to COVID-19, $16 million of which will reverse in fiscal 22. During fiscal 21, we drove a significant transformation of our balance sheet by delivering record-free cash flow and refinancing our long-term debt. For the full year, we generated $383 million of free cash flow compared to a use of 18 million in fiscal 20, a more than 400 million improvement year over year. To put this in context, heading into fiscal 21, we were targeting modestly positive free cash flow. This strong free cash flow generation helped us lower our net debt position by nearly 370 million and improved our leverage ratio to a record low 0.5 times versus 3.2 times a year ago. We ended the year with $126 million in cash, more than 10 times our cash balance at the end of fiscal 20, $319 million in long and short-term debt, and no outstanding balance on our ABL revolving credit facility. In addition, we own nine properties that can be monetized over time through sale leaseback transactions. For reference, over the last two fiscal years, we've sold 12 properties for an average of 13 million per site. From an inventory standpoint, we continued to improve our position. Total inventory at the end of Q4 was down 13% year over year, compared to down 20% at the end of Q3 and 30% at the end of Q2. Despite supply chain congestion and stronger than expected sales momentum, we have been able to replenish inventory at a faster pace than we're selling it to meet demand. Our inventory turns improved meaningfully during fiscal 21 as we continue to put greater emphasis in this area and leverage our enhanced planning and allocation capabilities. Looking forward, we are not providing formal guidance for the full year given the continued uncertainty related to COVID-19. However, with more than half of Q1 behind us and the challenge of modeling against the unusual backdrop of store closures in Q1 last year, we are providing a little bit of color on how we expect the quarter to play out. We do not expect to resume a formal full-year outlook in the near future. As Lee mentioned, Q1 is off to a fantastic start. Based on quarter-to-date performance and expected trends for the rest of Q1, we believe we can achieve comps of 142 to 153%. This would be an acceleration in comp trends on a two-year basis relative to the two-year trend in Q4. We expect Q1 net sales of 450 to 470 million versus 189.8 million in the year ago period. The midpoint of the range would imply net sales growth of 50% over a two-year period including store growth of 18% over the same two-year period. For modeling purposes, keep in mind that because of mandated store closures during the first quarter, Q1 comp store dollars were only 10% of our comps for all of fiscal 21. In terms of profitability, we believe Q1 adjusted operating income could be in the range of 55 to 63 million representing adjusted operating margins of approximately 12 to 13%. As you think about the longer term margin profile of at home, I wanted to provide some historical context. Based on the new lease accounting standards, our adjusted operating margins were 9.5% in fiscal 19, 5.9% in fiscal 20, and 13.7% in fiscal 21 on a 52 week basis. With 19% comps in fiscal 21, we drove more than 450 basis points of operating leverage, leading to outsized margins. On the other hand, in fiscal 20, with comps down slightly, 
our adjusted operating margins were below historical levels. Therefore, we tend to think of fiscal 19's 9.5% as more representative of the underlying margin profile of the business. With respect to fiscal year 22, given our incredibly strong start to the year and accelerating momentum, we would have expected fiscal 22 adjusted operating margins to be well above fiscal year 19. However, as Peter mentioned, near term, we have a high class problem. There is record demand for our business, but also incremental freight costs to bring in products to support this demand. As a team, we have worked hard and identified several offsets to the freight headwinds Peter described. Overall, based on everything we know today, our best thinking is that adjusted operating margins for fiscal 22 could be approximately 9%. In terms of phasing, given the two quarter lag from when we ship product to when these costs hit our P&L, we expect the impact of incremental freight costs to be greater in the back half of the year compared to the first half. All other things being equal, once the freight headwinds subside, we would expect our margin trends to normalize. Overall, we couldn't be more pleased with the continued momentum in our business, and we look forward to delivering another year of strong financial performance. With that, I'll turn the call back to Lee. Thanks, Jeff. Our extraordinary success this past year, despite unprecedented challenges and uncertainty, has demonstrated the resilience of both our business model and our team. We delivered incredible sales volumes, posted three of our biggest ever quarterly comps, generated significant positive free cash flow, and earned our largest profits to date. We had record sell-through on our Christmas, fall, and Halloween product, ending the year in a very clean inventory position. We grew our loyalty members by over 40% to over 9 million, successfully launched our omnichannel capabilities, and opened seven new stores during the year. These would have been remarkable achievements in any year but holds special significance given the difficult environment and the limited visibility we had for much of the year. As we look forward to fiscal 2022, we are highly confident in our strategies to propel us forward. We're acutely focused on three key areas, customer acquisition and retention, optimizing our inventory position, and the enhanced execution of our at-home 2.0 strategy. Over the last couple of quarters, we have experienced a step function increase in our customer base. These new customers have rated us higher than even our returning customers on KPIs such as product quality and value. Net promoter scores and satisfaction are equally strong among new and existing customers. Meanwhile, our Insider Perks Loyalty Program, which was recently named as one of the top loyalty programs in the country by Newsweek, continues to see very strong growth. We added a record 2.6 million members to Insider Perks during fiscal 21. Insider Perk members continue to have deeper engagement with us and a meaningfully bigger basket size than non-Perks members. These factors, when combined, give us increased confidence in the ability to retain our customer base. At the same time, we plan to drive additional new customer growth through our brand building and acquisition advertising strategies. At-home's unaided brand awareness increased steadily during fiscal 21, and in Q4 was up a strong 400 basis points year over year, a good indication of our increased relevance with home decor shoppers. Given the unprecedented level of competitor store closing and the billions of dollars in business up for grabs, our targeted acquisition marketing efforts are also beginning to bear fruit. Our second focus is optimizing our inventory position especially in seasonal categories. You may recall that our seasonal business was severely inventory constrained in the back half of last fiscal year. In fact, our Q4 seasonal comps, while healthy, were more than 30 points lower than our everyday comps, providing some indication of the opportunity we have this year. Being in a better seasonal inventory position is already evident in our first quarter momentum. In addition, I'm very excited about our fall and Christmas merchandise which adds to my confidence in our seasonal top line opportunity this coming year. Third is the enhanced execution of our at-home 2.0 strategy to ensure we have the most effective go-to-market approach, industry-leading prices, and accessibility to our products through the most convenient channels for our customers. As Chad mentioned, we now have a full year of learning from over 
a dozen EDLP Plus campaigns in fiscal 21. These learnings are helping us refine our approach and building on our success, just as we did recently with our Bed Bath & Storage event. We have exciting new reinventions, collaborations, and products to announce in the coming months. For competitive reasons, we plan to discuss these closer to launch. We continue to enhance our omnichannel offering, which we launched only a year ago. And we plan to test ship from store in the fall of this year and drop ship next year. With respect to unit growth, I'm excited we've recently resumed new store openings, reigniting our key growth engine. Year to date, we've already opened six net new stores. With increased visibility, we're now confident in opening 15 net new stores this year, the upper end of our previous target of 12 to 15. The additional stores will open in Q3, and total new store openings will be equally split between new and existing markets, reflecting our thoughtful and balanced approach. We have a robust real estate pipeline with a clear line of sight for the next several years, and our opportunities are only getting stronger. As we've said before, Next year in fiscal 23, we plan to resume 10% annual unit growth. As we reflect on the long term, we are excited to be in a large and growing industry. We believe the tailwinds of strong home sales, nesting, and deurbanization are likely to continue to benefit our industry over the foreseeable future. However, as was evident last year, this rising tide isn't lifting all boats equally. At Home's differentiated model and effective execution has helped us emerge as a key winner in our category. We've always said that our unmatched breadth and depth of assortment at everyday low prices and our low-cost operating model set us apart. In addition, our warehouse-like stores provide tremendous flexibility to pivot and adapt to omnichannel, which we believe is the most sustainable long-term model. We're still in the early innings of many exciting initiatives and remain focused on delivering strong and consistent results. We continue to see a long runway with potential for 600 plus stores over time, up from 225 stores today. Based on the current performance of some of our more mature markets, we think there is a potential for sales per store to average $10 million or more over the long run, especially with a robust omnichannel strategy that we can increase our customer reach. In other words, at 600 stores, we have the potential to be an omnichannel retailer with more than $6 billion in annual revenue. We have never been more confident in our customer value proposition, competitive positioning, and our ability to capture this large opportunity ahead. I would like to close by thanking our team members and shareholders for your continued support of At Home. With that, operator, please open up the line for questions. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary for you to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment while we pull for questions. Our first question comes to the line of Simeon Gutman with Morgan Stanley. You may proceed with your question. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice results uh, in the start to the year. My first question, maybe for Jeff, if if um, freight costs weren't an incremental headwind, can you give us a sense where you would be guiding the margin, and are there any other puts or takes relative to um, you know going back to that nine percent, meaning selling margin? You're just making a planning assumption that, mar you know, that maybe selling margins will also be under some pressure. Yeah, Simeon, you know, as we said in our prepared remarks, we would have expected it to be, you know, well above those fiscal 19 margins uh, of 9.5%. Um, you know, when you think about the puts and takes in the P&L, certainly uh, freight is the largest one there, and there's really nothing other unusual, you know, going on. Um, outside of the incremental freight that that's dragging us to be below normal uh, this year in our outlook. And, and a follow up to that, and you know, I respect if if you want you don't want to be that specific, but can you can you put maybe some guardrails around the freight? You know, in terms of you know, hundred basis points, fifty basis points, anything more uh, more granular. Uh, we won't be that specific. I would say, obviously, when we, we point you back to the 9.5% in fiscal 19 and then 9% outlook this year, I would say, 
because we're expecting this year to be above average, you know, by definition, it is greater than 50 basis points. But, you know, at this time, you know, we're not quantifying it. And, you know, the full impact of that headwind is embedded in, in the 9%. Fair enough. And, and if I maybe can pivot um, onto sales, um, wondering if you have enough data on like customers and want so so when you can look at your your spending whether it's this year or you know a, a, a quarter ago whether it's the same customer uh who was spending with you during the pandemic versus new ones and then what items are they buying uh you know as you, i'm sure you contemplated some of this as you put your plan together for this year sure simian Lee. we've seen a lot of new customer growth the industry grew about you know obviously some significant increase in the industry overall but overall, if you take all the home decor and home furnishings players, their growth combined was really from existing customers coming in and spending more often. We saw that as well, our existing customers coming in and spending, uh, spending more with us. But we also saw significant new customer growth. We had a 40% increase in our Insider Perks membership. That would tell you that those are new customers. So we're really pleased with that new customer growth and the existing customer coming in and coming in slightly more often and their basket size were bigger. So we're really pleased with with that performance overall. And you know, going forward, obviously, how do we retain these customers? That's going to be a key focus of, of ours going forward. We've had we, our, our brand is super healthy right now. Our in, our new customers indicate strong satisfaction and high intent to repurchase. They rate us higher on KPIs like product quality and value, and our NPS score is up significantly. So we feel like we've got momentum with those new customers and a, a great deal of satisfaction with our existing customers from the performance we had last year, as well as obviously the momentum we're seeing moving into the first quarter. Great, thank you, good luck. Thanks, Amy. Our next question comes from the line of John Hainbockel with Guggenheim. You may proceed with your question. So let me start um, either for Lee or Chad or both of you guys. When you, when you think about um, assessing and, and trying to figure out demand for the back half of the year, uh, and I know you're you you are you're going to flow inventory in three or, in three or four waves, but you think about um, the things people can spend money on in the back half of the year, right? Travel and, and so forth, which they couldn't last year. What what challenge does that present, and how do you think about demand in the back half of this year, and how you want to plan for that? Yeah, for us. This past back half of the year was inventory constrained significantly. Obviously, with 90% full price selling in Christmas, that would tell you that there was a lot more business to be had if we had the product. So we've looked at what our out-of-stocks were and when those dates were by store and have seen a lot of opportunities. So, yes, people have more options to choose to spend their more money, but we left a lot of money on the table. So we're really pleased with the tools that we put in place from an inventory planning and analytics uh, standpoint that helps us look at the business. And as we've looked at our uh, performance last fall and we look and plan for this coming fall, we take those opportunities into, into, uh, into our thought process. We also put in multiple flows so we can read the business throughout spring and through the summer. So if we need to clip orders, if, there's, if there is, um, you know, let's say, uh, less demand than we originally planned, then we can, we can adjust those up front. Um, so we have less risk. We can also allocate it to where the business is. And with those later flows, we can allocate it where the demand is. So we feel like we've risk mitigated those situations. At the same time, really leaned into the opportunity. There was a lot of money left on the back on the back side last year. And as you know, we buy in halves. So, you know, patio is in spring and summer, and Halloween, harvest, and Christmas is in the back half. In the first half of the year, we got an easy compare um, from a 0 0.3 comp in the back half. Uh, we've got more challenging compares, but not when it comes to seasonal. There's a there's a lot of opportunity there for us to buy. Maybe as a follow up to that, so seasonal in the fourth quarter, I know you had planned it to be up uh, low single digit. It, I don't think it was up double digit, right? It was probably up five, five to ten. And do you think next year could it be up substantially uh, greater than that? It was, you know, it was low doubles um, on the on the seasonal side, which we were really pleased. Um, and it was better full price selling. It wasn't like we could get any more product, so we're pleased. But there was just a lot of money left on the table, and so we're we're buying behind those ideas. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned what the customer wants, especially with these new customers too. What were they interested in buying? And so we've been able to plan our assortment accordingly and and go after that opportunity. 
Maybe just lastly, when you think about marketing, and, and, and not so much marketing dollars, I think more outreach, right, email, email outreach to customers, how will this year be different than last year, right? You've, you've acquired a lot of customers. Is, is the idea hit, hit them on each of the events and, and see if you can get some, um, some engagement on at least some of those events? Is that, is that the primary focus? Well, there's a number of things we're focused on in marketing. First is we're going to spend more money. Uh, we're targeting 3.5% of sales. That will help continue the momentum forward. We've not spent that level uh, in our history. We've wanted to, uh, but uh, oftentimes sales has outpaced that, so we're going to be spending more money. Our creative is focused on acquiring new customers and keeping the Insider Perks members that we've gained engaged. Our brand voice changed. You may have noticed that in the back half of the year. It's far more fun and playful, and it reflects our brand personality and, and a lot more what we say, more Southwest Airlines, less American Airlines. It will differentiate us. We don't take ourselves very seriously. I mean, in our space, most people are very serious. They're sold in, fan sold in fancy stores and, and uh, with commission sales folks. We're not. We're concrete floors, metal shelves, not, you know, it's self-help model. So why take ourselves seriously? So the tone is different. We're going to spend the money against supporting EDLP Plus events. We've seen that that's drove traffic, which is what we want, and frequency, which is what we need. Um, we were, are going to be able to talk about our new news around seasonal collaborations. With these collaborations, you, you, you have some cut through with that. The value proposition has continued to be enhanced. We've got our, you know, our best price promise in the store, hassle-free returns. But prices are going to be larger, and we've actually changed the size of our hang tags on our product and our packaging to be bigger on the prices. So we're, we're loud and proud about our prices. Our direct mail campaign is going to be very targeted. Um, the, 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 the loyalty team, our CRM team, we now have a team, and we're focused on how do we get uh, more out of each decile. And so that's going to be focused uh, effort on our part and more uh, – targeted and customized for the customer. And digital always is uh, it's more than half of our customers are coming to the website before they even come to the store. So digital is super important. So maybe a long answer to a short question, but that's the comprehensive approach that we're taking to marketing because we feel we can gain more customers still this year and keep uh, you know most of the customers that came in last year and have them spend even more than last year. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, John. Our next question comes from the line of David Bellinger with Wolf Research. You may proceed with your question. Hey, great. Thanks for taking the questions here. Um, so you, you mentioned the acceleration in January comps, and that's continued on as a Q1. So can you comment on the any impact from the adverse weather in, in Texas and the surrounding markets, and just how much of a headwind has that been quarter to date? And could sales have been even stronger than some of the ex expectations you've outlined for Q1? Sure. I mean, obviously, it was a tough time for our home state. Our sympathies are with those that were affected. There was a lot of people affected, uh, broken pipes and people, you know, have significant home damage. Um, many, many of our team members had that, too. So we're very sensitive to that. We have several stores that were closed or limited hours for a couple of days during the storm. Um, but business rebounded. As soon as the temperature warmed up, business, business bounced back, too, as soon as people got power back. So our comp guidance includes the February weather impact. So you can see that, obviously, we had strong momentum in January, um, a slight step back just because of the storm, but that was the only step back we've seen. It's been really strong business for us, especially when we're talking about, you know, comps over 140 for the, for the quarter. Got it. And just another one on the, the freight costs here. So how are you assessing the, the trade-off of incremental sales versus lower margin rates in, in light of these cost pressures? Is there some type of framework we can think about there? And is there even a scenario on the table where you, know, you, you could sacrifice sales growth in order to you know, maintain higher margin rates? Yeah, I mean, I would say right now, David, I mean, we're working incredibly hard with our merchant team and, and Peter's team on the operations side to prioritize the freight, making sure that we have the right product coming in to support our sales. and even with, you know, the incremental freight costs and what that costs us in terms of incremental margin, the right thing to do for the business, both near-term and long-term, is to get that product onto the selling floor and sell that through. So uh, it's not to the extent right now where we would ever sacrifice sales in lieu of avoiding some near-term incremental freight charges. 
Understood. Appreciate the help here. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, David. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Carol Martinson. You may proceed with your question. Good afternoon. Just in terms of the, the store footprint uh, as you guys expand, you know, what's the, the real estate opportunities out there uh, for you all? Yeah, there's obviously, you know, we've been doing this, I've been doing this for eight and a half years. I've always seen a nice pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of stores that are available. We're excited about what's possible with our brand. We can make a lot of different things work uh, because of the capability of our real estate architecture and construction team and our store ops team. We've A store that just opened just last week in Oklahoma City was three different store fronts side by side all torn, you know, the walls torn out between them and turned into an at-home store, and we're thrilled with that location already. Uh, that's an example. We can take a store that was maybe smaller size and it can take some of the parking spot, uh, spots out from the side of it, extend the length of the store, or we can just drop into bigger stores and, and put in a false wall or, 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 or a wall to make it only the 85,000 square feet we need. So we can be very flexible. Um, and, you know, the pandemic is creating winners and losers out there, We've been emerging stronger and better positioned and taking share. Others are closing the door. We're one of the only, we're really the only national retailer interested in boxes this size. So people call us first. Um, so I'm, you know, I would tell you, I feel great about our pipeline. I'm confident in our 600 plus store potential. There's so many markets where we're just starting, you know, quite frankly, California has just a few stores. We can get to over 90 stores there. Um, New York tri-state area, you know, it's just getting started. And, you know, we can do just so many there. So I'm, I'm thrilled with what's there. I'm grateful for what our team can do. And I don't see a constraint in terms of boxes. And, and when you look at the omni-channel capabilities of the, your store fleet, I think you mentioned 70% you know, can handle BOPIS. Um, you know, what are the limitations that you see there with your existing fleet? And what do you look for in, in, in the new locations? Um, say the question again, just to make sure I get it right. I thought I heard that you guys said that you were handling BOPIS um, by online and the Omni Channel at 70% of your locations. I just wanted to understand, like, what's the limitation for for going fully to all all of your stores? Oh, sure. That yeah. Sorry. Thank you for clarifying that. We have by online pickup in store and curbside pickup at all of our locations. Okay. Um, we have. We have delivery at 70% of our locations, and that's just a constraint on our delivery partner. Um, and they're working on adding more uh, markets for, to support us. Uh, and that's next day local delivery, and it's with, uh, with Pickup. That's the name of the company. And Postmates is also a partner of ours as well through them, through their tool. So we're, we're, we're working on adding more markets. But we, in every single store, you can do buy online, pick up in store, and curbside pickup. And we look forward to uh, testing ship from store in the back half of this year to, to make us essentially available nationally to anybody. Okay, sorry, my apologies for, for oh, okay. hearing that. Um, and just lastly, you know, it, it's an interesting dilemma in, in the sense that you were inventory constrained, yet uh, you kind of proved the inelasticity of, of your product with the 90% the full price selling. I mean, does that change at all in, in terms of how how you look at your pricing architecture going forward? I wouldn't say it changes our pricing architecture. We're going to focus on being the lowest price out there. We need to win on price. And when we do that, we become more accessible to everyone. And that's what we want to do. Uh, what I would tell you, you get the price right and you get the product right, you can sell it at full price and it's not a markdown. What we did learn with less inventory this year, and we got better in terms of inventory positions throughout the year. We were down 30% in Q2, down 20% in Q3, and down uh, roughly 13% in Q4. Obviously, we got in better inventory position. We can actually run this business with slightly less inventory. And that's what we've learned, is we can be better and smarter. That's what Chad talked about, is rationalizing our SKU count, buying behind bigger ideas, and uh, making sure that we've got the appropriate depth by store based on demand, using a lot more of the science and the data analytics around being more efficient. That's what we learned we could do better, and that's what we're taking those learnings to help us continue to get the right product at the right store at the right time, to drive the right outcome for the consumer, 
and the right profit for our company. Our next question comes from the line of Jeremy Hamblin with Craig Hallam. You may proceed with your question. Thanks, and congrats on a, on a great quarter and year. Um, I want to piggyback on that last point uh, about your inventory management and the adjustments um, that you've made, which sounds to me like your markdown risk is probably going to be a little lower going forward. So as we think about this year, and <clears throat> possibly by the time we get to Q4, uh, we may be in a more normal environment, less COVID impact, hopefully. Um, as we think about that differential between, you know, 10% uh, goods sold at uh, markdown prices versus uh, 30% in a normal year, um, you know, given this change in inventory management and planning and allocation, you know, what's kind of in your target in terms of how you would think about, and, and we can use Q4 as the example, on how you would think about, uh, you know, the percentage of goods that would be marked down on a normalized basis going forward in something like Q4? Sure, Jeremy. Uh, what I'll talk about first is inventory planning and just the, the progress we've made. And Jeff will cover a little bit of the margins on that. But what I would say on the planning side, at Home 2.0, one of the key pillars of our at Home 2.0 effort was inventory management. We doubled the number of planners and allocators. We wanted more, we wanted more analytics around it and more eyes on our decisions. We put new tools in place and we created this and enhanced the data analytics team looking at sales curves, which then is provided to our, our buying team. And the buyers, I would tell you, we've upgraded the quality of our buying team as well. They're just fantastic at picking great product. And then our planning team is helping inform how much to buy. You put those things to, together, better quality product on the mark, priced right, and then bought appropriately, you're going to end up with less markdowns. You also have a process from uh, an everyday standpoint now. It's every other week we do an open to buy so we can adapt quickly our orders up and down based on what we're seeing. Uh, I would tell you as we think about, um, as we think about our, our product assortments, we're doing assortment planning overall to make sure that we have a full and a collected assortment. Um, when you make those decisions and then you put it through an EDLP Plus program, which is when you're highlighting certain categories, and then you separate your full price from your markdown. Your markdown sell-through has been better because of the separation. The full price looks fantastic. It's not, it's not all um, jammed together with some markdown product as well, so it's easier to shop in both cases. And as we look at our customer, there's bargain hunters and there's home decor enthusiasts is the way we're calling them. The bargain hunters like the separated uh, clearance, which is through EDLP+. Plus. So our markdown management is better. We're selling more at first mark. So I would tell you all of those things put in place is helping us have, I would say, less risk going forward to, your, to answer your question around markdowns. And, uh, and I would tell you it's better buying from a quality of the assortment and the strategy around it, and it's fantastic analytics around the, uh, the amount you buy and where you send it. On the margin side, Jeff? Jeremy, yeah, you know, as Lee said, you know, one of the biggest learnings coming out of COVID for us was that we could do more with less. I would also say, you know, one of the other learnings is that we can task ourselves with looking for to sell more at full price in our seasonal assortments. And historically, you know, we'd look to sell 70% of the buy at full price. And moving forward, obviously, it's going to be very hard to replicate the 90% that we saw in the back half of this year. But um, our merchant teams and Chad and his team are focused on delivering 80% um, in this coming year, and, and that should be the new normal for us moving forward. Great. That's what I was looking for. Um, and then just uh, two you know, uh, quick follow-ups here. In terms of uh, thinking about Q1, Q2, uh, seasonal as a percent of sales in Q1, and then uh, seasonal as a percent of sales in Q2 on a typical basis? Yeah, on a typical basis, you would normally see – uh, Q1 would be right around 25%, and then Q2 it would be closer to 30, the low 30% um, in a normal year. Do you expect that to be different this year, more seasonal goods? Right now, it should it could vary a little bit, Jeremy, but I would say, you know, it's shaping up right now, and the mix that we're seeing is pretty consistent with what we would have expected based on history. 
Okay, got it. And then the last one for me actually is uh, just coming back to the the FG&A expense here. You've you've indicated you're going to do a little more marketing than you typically have. Um, you know, in terms of just thinking about your uh, more normalized SG&A levels, and, and clearly you're not going to have that in Q1 because you're running, you know, giant sales numbers. Um, but in terms of thinking about where that that level's going to be, you, you you've kind of had, you know, 22% as the baseline. Um, you know, there's been some years that have varied from that, but generally speaking, 22 has been kind of the bogey. Uh, as a percent of sales, is that still what you would think is the case? Is, that, is there a target that you guys have out there? Maybe it's easier, Jeremy, to talk about it in, in terms of dollars um, than percents. Okay. And so if, if you fair. look if you look at the back half of the year, right, and you know whether it's the midpoint or the upper end of what we just talked about, uh, for Q1 in that 450 to 470 range, you know, we did 470 million in sales in Q3 this past year, and that was at, you know, 20.7 percent, um, 97 million dollars. Obviously, there was elevated incentive compensation in those dollars, but there was also lower than normal advertising expense, and there was also lower than normal pre-opening expense because we had paused. Um, our new store development program. So when you put all those moving pieces together, they pretty much net out in the wash. And you know that Q th those Q3 dollars or percent um, would probably be pretty close to um, typical when you look at our Q1 guide for for the sales level that you're looking for in Q1. Yeah, because the the sales level, you know, at the midpoint is 10 million less than we actually did in Q3. I think we did 470 million in Q3 last year. So okay. it, it's pretty apples to apples. Okay. But let's just say if the Q2 sales level was a little bit lower uh than Q1, then you would expect your SG&A a little bit lower as well. The dollars would be right because the, the variable, dollars. you know, yeah, obviously store labor, the receipts would be a little lower. And you know, marketing expenses and those other things would would come down commensurately. Great, super helpful. Uh, congrats, guys. Uh, thanks. Good luck. Thanks, Jeremy. Our next question comes from the line of Curtis Nagel with Bank of America. You may proceed with your question. Uh, good evening, guys. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, it might be tough to segment out, but just curiously, if you could talk a little bit about. Um, you know, uh, one Q, uh, you know, so far at least, uh, looks like a pretty lights out quarter. You know, what, what's driving the acceleration, you know, um, over obviously uh, 2020 and, and, and 2019 by a pretty good degree. You know, how much of that is new customers, the re-up on inventory, the reinventions? I mean, what, what do you think is the most incremental factor? Sure. What I would say first and foremost, uh, Kurt, is the momentum continues and to gain strength since uh, since Q4. And now we're no longer inventory constrained like we were in Q4 on the seasonal side. So the efforts around at home 2.0 EDLP plus campaigns are working strong. We have inventory positions, which has, has improved. I'm, I'm pleased with that. You know, and I would say we're growing two to three times faster than the industry from what our data is. So, you know, we're gaining clear share um, and all, all of our departments are performing well, um, which we're really pleased with both the, spring product, so patio and garden is performing extremely well, um, and as well as the everyday product. Uh, stimulus is helping, but as you know, um, we may have mentioned before, we found that the stimulus is only like a four-week uh, benefit, and it's like icing on the cake. It's not the cake. It's a, it's a nice little upside for us, but it, that is not what's driving these, these numbers. What's driving these numbers is our momentum and our performance, and I'm really pleased uh, and I would also tell you some of the other things that are helping is just the macro trends. Housing, nesting, deurbanization clearly is is in our favor, as which kind of works into the industry numbers. Competitors closing from last year has helped. But I would tell you we expect these trends to remain strong throughout the quarter, and it's really the work that we're doing that's making this happen versus what you know the industry or the stimulus is doing. Got it. Um, and uh, forgive me if you haven't. Uh, or you already spoke to this, but just um, 
you know, any commentary in terms of uh, how to think about free cash flow, capital allocation? Uh, I think you've already put up three stores. What, what's the plan for uh, uh, the remainder of the year? Uh, I think it's uh, what about six percent growth, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe yeah, less. Uh, fifteen net new stores is, is what our target is as of today's call. We had said twelve to fifteen previously, and um, and we're really happy that you know the pipeline and reopening everything is going to allow us to get to 15 this year. And CapEx for the year? Any any comments on that? Uh, CapEx for the year, probably um, the easiest way to, to think about it is, you know, go back to fiscal 20. Um, we opened about two times the stores um, and had gross CapEx of right around $250 million. Um, so with, you know, the vast, vast majority of our CapEx relates to our new store development program. So with half the stores opening, um, we would expect roughly half the CapEx uh, this year. Got it. Okay. Thanks very much, and uh, good luck for the rest of the year. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Curtis. Our next question comes to the line of Zach Fathom with Wells Fargo. You may proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Uh, so this is a business that has historically you've opened stores at very high productivity, and then this would translate to a low single-digit comp level. But as we look at the state of the business today and all this change, I'm curious how you think about these these dynamics and whether you still think the, the high productivity, low comp algorithm is, is still the right way to think about this, this company uh, over the long term. Yeah, what, what I would say is I'm really pleased with the productivity of our existing stores. Uh, we saw great performance across all vintages this year. Uh, our average store sales now is about $8 million. It used to be $7 million. So when I mentioned that our potential is to have $10 million stores on average, we already do that. We have stores that do uh, almost twice the company average uh, and some markets that do well over 10 so there's, there's potential to make these stores continue to be more productive and continue to drive same-store sales out of our store base. And they just mature well. I mean, honestly, their older stores, comp, uh, about the company average, as well as our newer stores, did very well. I, the rhythm that we've said is over the longer term, we still see this as a, as a low single-digit business. Um, but in the near term, obviously, you can see when all things work the way we want them to work, it's been much stronger. And so we're obviously doing the things we feel like we need to to drive outsized performance. And we also feel like there's some macro factors that help us as well that make that, um, that, that long-term algorithm um, much more attainable and we can uh, blow past it. But for the long term, we still feel comfortable with that. That's the, the model. Gotcha. And as I look at your SG&A on a per-store basis was up only about 8% this year. Obviously, it was constrained in the first half by, by furloughs. You, you lowered your marketing spend. But, but as we look at the normalization of, of that line uh, this year, how should we think about per store SG&A growth? Zach, I, I would say really, you know, SG&A is one of those things that over longer periods of time, you know, needs to be measured. And there was just a lot of funny things that went on, as you mentioned, in the first half of the year with us cutting discretionary expenses, the lack of pre-opening, pulling back on marketing, the furloughed and tiered salary reductions. Um, I would say when you think about the back half of the year, you know, and, and we've talked about the incentive compensation dynamics, but normalizing um, you know, for the five-ish million per quarter and above average incentive compensation, that that would be more indicative of a per store SG&A run rate, um, you know, than looking at the full year numbers, just given, you know, the funny dynamics between the front and back half. Got it. So, so that's kind of, call it a, a high 20s rate when you adjust for, for the, um, you know, the, the these items? high 20s on a per store basis i mean in total you know we were running in you know the call it the 21 percent range you know of adjusted sgna to total sales that was slightly below our historical average um but then you know to take those dollars and put it on a per store basis um i 
I'd have to do that math um, to, to see if that checks out. Gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, appreciate the time, guys. All right. Thanks, Zach. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Jonathan Matsusiski with Jeffries. You may proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Congrats on the quarter and uh, early 1Q trend. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, first one was just uh, curious if you've looked at trends in markets that have uh, reopened more than others uh, or, or those markets with maybe a higher vaccination uh, rates. Uh, there are some players in the industry suggesting that the category uh, is actually outperforming in markets uh, with populations that are spending less time in their homes uh, as the uh, local economies have reopened. So I know you mentioned geography strength is broad, but uh, any color there would be interesting. Yeah, what I would say, Jonathan, um, is this performance for us has been broad-based. It really has. Uh, you know, across the country. And yes, we've got a, a, a nice presence in states like Texas that were, have been more open, an, an emerging presence in Florida. Um, but, you know, we, we're, we're performing just as well in those states as we are as an upper Midwest and the, and, and the Northeast, which uh, may have be considered more slightly tighter in their, in their uh, restrictions. It, it's is the nice thing is it's been very, very broad, uh, and it's been it's more about how long has this, the market been open, and the more mature the market is, the stronger the market is for us um, in terms of sales per store, in terms of absolute dollars, and that for us is, it gives us the greatest amount of confidence in this business. Is the, these stores mature nicely, markets mature nicely, our brand awareness continues to grow, and as we grow our brand awareness in a market, the, the business responds and the sales per store responds. And that's what I'm most excited about. So, yes, uh, you know, we, we look at it that way, but it's really broad-based across, across the country. Gotcha. That's helpful. And then uh, just a question on inventory. You mentioned paying up uh, higher freight costs to get the uh, product across the ocean and in the stores. Um, just any color in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how your competitors are approaching this issue. Um, you know, they're not seeing the growth that you guys are, but, um, you know, how do you expect most of your, your peers to uh, react here? Do you, do you expect them to kind of also, you know, pay up at, at similar rates, or would you expect them to be kind of, you know, left leaner on inventory? Um, hard to generalize, but, but any color in terms of maybe what you're hearing from, from your vendor partners uh, would be uh, helpful. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, this is Peter. I'd say the global situation is not unique to us in any way, and neither is the fact that rates have increased at a much faster pace than expected. But in addition to that, our sales have been very, very strong, uh, causing our volume to be much higher than expected and outside of our, our contracted volumes. Um, with the current situation, we've been extremely proactive and focused on supporting our strong uh, demand with product flow, and generally, we're replenishing our inventory much faster than the rate of sales each week. In fact, from data provided by our transportation partners, we believe our backlog is well below the industry average right now. So does this get better? Yes, it does. Um, as our volume adjusted contracts uh, go into place May 1st, uh, also we're the 35th largest importer in terms of Q, which we think gives us an, a, a advantage right now and certainly a bigger advantage as we go forward into these negotiations. Um, and so I'd say uh, just as a reminder too that freight costs is recognized with the turn of the inventory for us as well. But we expect things to normalize as we go into the back half and our contracts take place. And, and Jonathan, that 35th is 35th largest importer across the entire economy, not just in our sector. Uh, and we've found uh, Peter's team and our partners in this uh, are doing a fantastic job. And what I would say is people back winners, and they prioritize and support winners, and that's how we've been able to get our backlog lower than others is because they see the momentum in our business and they want to support winners because they know the volume is going to continue to grow for us, and so they want to support people that are going to help build their business. That's, uh, that's helpful. Thanks, guys. Best of luck for the quarter. All right. Thanks, Jonathan.
ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the, the end of today's question and answer session. I would like to turn this call back over to Mr. Lee Bird for closing remarks. All right, thanks, Laura. Thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to talking to you in the coming days and weeks. Take care and be safe. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time.